Hello, I'm Wayne Garvey, and welcome to the first of our this year's US Game Changers session. This is an opportunity to meet and indeed question some of the key executives in American television. And throughout, you can pose uh, your own questions through the Edinburgh Festival app, and we'll have some questions from the floor as well. But please, give a warm welcome to a US Game Changer who happens to be a Brit, Paul Lee. You came on perfectly there, Paul, as opposed to me. I stumbled on you. Yeah, you and, came early, as you said. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. did. Um, <laughs> Paul, before we start, we should see some of, the, some of your up-and-coming treats, shouldn't we? Fantastic. Can we roll the tape, please? Blimey. I do love an American taster tape. They're always a little bit better than the British ones, it seems to me, Paul. I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on there. And in the last few years, you've sort of brought through a range of programs that really seems to transform ABC. Has there sort of been a general overall vision? Or? Yeah, I mean, look, when, when I started, um, we were coming to the end of three big franchises that had defined ABC, and they were Lost, Desperate, and, and Greys. Um, but it turned out Greys was not only alive and kicking, it was going to have many, many years to come. And we kind of used that in the new show that we had, which was called Modern Family, to say, let's build a hero brand. Let's, let's, let's really power behind the strengths of those shows. They're sophisticated, they're emotional, they're sexy, and they really deliver to a very upscale audience that our advertisers love. The reason why you see these hero tapes is we have the ritual every May of standing in front of all our advertisers, and I, who you know, went into being an executive because I am not an actor, has to get up and perform and show a hero tape, so I hide behind our hero tapes, and they. And we do billions of dollars of business you know, in that few weeks beyond that. But that positioning for us has been tremendously successful. You saw a lot of Shonda Rhimes there. Mm -hmm. We built out our Thursday night with Shonda. Um, she's an incredibly strong, glorious showrunner. And we have Grey's and then Scandal, which is a big hit for us. And then How to Get Away with Murder on Thursdays. But our Wednesday nights, you know, built around Modern Family, have The Middle and Goldberg's, which is a fabulous show, and then Modern, and then Blackish, which is our new entrant, and Once Upon a Time, and, and many other franchises. So it's it certainly, we're at a stage now, and it's mainly because I have such a good team around me, where the, the network's really, really firing on all cylinders. I, I, I presume your office is dominated by a small shrine to Shonda Rhimes. Totally, of yeah. course it is. Yeah, not so small, <laughs> but um, she's wonderful and, and a magnificent partner because, you know, each time we do a show together, we're like, okay, how are we going to reinvent it now? Um, and one of the things we lent into um, was the notion, because it was very clear five years ago that procedurals were dominant, and we went, you know what, we think serialized may be about to have a comeback, so let's see if we can't try to reinvent that. And we had a lot of fun with Once Upon a Time and Scandal and Nashville and many other of those franchises. Uh, what's quite interesting looking at that range, particularly Shonda, Shonda's work, there's a big lesson for us in the UK. We spent a lot of time over the last year debating diversity, on-screen diversity, also trying to get a generation of writers, producers, directors from a background that is very different to where we're. You know, are there any lessons you think from your experience in the US that we could adopt here in the UK? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't presume sort of to say what's the right thing here. I've been out of the country for like 17 years and I'm spectacularly ignorant. But what, but what I can sort of say is what worked for us. That's all, that's all I can do. And I, I think we'd always felt strongly we, with the American Broadcasting Company. I know that sounds weird with a transatlantic accent, but with the American Broadcasting Company and we should reflect the world around us. Um, but five years ago, we thought very strongly, look, there is a demographic wave in America every bit as valuable as the technological wave. And both of them are going to change content and should change the stories that we tell. And you know, I'm a strong believer that you can't say, well, look, let's set aside a budget and let's put a few people on one side. And their job is diversity. You know, we actually call it inclusion, not diversity, because our job is to reflect the world around us, a world where millennials are dominated by Latinos, for instance. And so you really have to be in the DNA of who you are. I mean, if you, if you look at ABC, and I, you know, I'm surrounded by people who are better at their jobs than I am, and since I'm a Brit, you know, probably have a better sense of what we should be doing. 
But you know, my head of drama is African American, my, my head of uh, comedy development is Asian American, my head of casting is Asian American, my, my, my head of marketing is Latina, my head of PR is Irish, but we'll forget over that. <laughs> I'm married to an Irish woman. I'm gonna, I, I'm going to pay for that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but and 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 what we what we realized was, you know, it's it's very important to have faces on the network that reflect the country. That's important, and you know, we're proud to have been at the forefront of that. We're not the only people doing it. But Scandal was a big a big moment, and obviously Empire is is too. And so is How to Get Away with Murder. And we believe Viola Davis's performance is so great. Um, she she should really win the Emmy this year, and that's important. But what's most important is to find voices, voices who reflect your audience. And once you can swim upstream and get to showrunners, as certainly we call it in the US, I, I think we called it producer directors when I was at the BBC, but once you can get to voices that are really reflecting the different parts of the American experience, and that could be Adam Goldberg, or it could be Kenya Barris on Blackish, yeah. or it could be Nanachka Khan on, 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 on Fresh Off the Boat, then you're gonna get an incredibly specific story, and the more specific the story is, this is ironic, the more universal it can be. Because if we go out to make a universal story, people tried to repeat Friends for 15 years, it wasn't repeatable. Yeah. But if we go to Kenya and say, tell us your story, it actually, for our network, has resonated better. Mm. I, I think that's quite interesting about, it's almost, don't start with the performance, it's that team around you reflecting the society in which you in which you exist, and I, I feel that's kind of, we haven't got that right in Britain yet. For some reason, we haven't got that generation of writers and the producers and executives, and I, I don't know, we might get there. Well, I hope we do, but I, I don't know how we can fast track it. Well, some of it is cultural in the US. There are some communities, you know, who, who don't love entertainment for their kids as much as others do. But a lot of it is, and this goes against what I was saying about DNA, but you have to have, we have an incredibly aggressive program uh, run by Kelly Lee and our casting, which is out there finding new talent on screen all the time. We have incredibly aggressive, uh, different programs, finding showrunners, writers, directors, and we've been doing that for 10, 15 years, and that, you can't do it without that. But if you want to reflect the country, then you have to reflect the country. I'm just talking for the American perspective. Yeah, I, I find that quite. I know Kelly, who, who, who does your casting very well, and I, I know as probably quite a few people in this room do because she's often in Britain, actually, where, where she's extremely popular, actually, Paul. Um, because of course <laughs> I just she, find this surprising. Uh, I yeah. know, because uh, she's also looking for international talent to, to work as well. Yeah. That, I mean, that's your view, isn't it? You think very much. You're, you're based in America, but your vision really is, is global, it seems to me, particularly ABC Studios. Yeah, I mean, I'm often accused of bringing Brits to America, and, you know, but the reality is, you know, the casting, particularly during pilot season, is brutal. There have always been 70 or 80 pilots that are coming out of the four big broadcast networks, but once you add all the scripted that cable are doing, and pay cable, and digital, you now have an incredible fight for talent that goes on, and only the strong brands that people relate to only, and this has been our competitive advantage, the great scripts that drive great character will attract you know, talent like Maria Enos. And we are looking for great talent all the way across the board. There is clearly, I mean, British acting talent you know, is just as good as British writing talent and British directing talent. And the network is full of all of those, but there are great Australian um, actors as well, Priyanka Chopra, um, you know, is going to be leading our show Quantico um, on Sunday nights this fall. She's amazing. Um, our job is to tell incredible stories. Where I think you are right is that not only have we made, and it's not us, but not only have a group of us made American television more diverse in American terms, but also more diverse in terms of re reflecting people's talent from around the world. And it's only enriched us. Yeah, well, I mean, this is quite ironic that we're talking about US game changers because, of course, you are a Brit. You may deny it. You haven't been there for 70 and you started at the BBC reporting on Northern Ireland. You, you work with people like Alan Yentob. I did. Uh, how the hell did you end up running ABC? I don't, I don't, how the hell did that happen? I don't, I don't. <laughs> what, what, I, what I did, I worked for Arena for many years. I loved it. I was a producer director. Um, and Alan had just taken over music and arts, and Anthony Wall was the guy running it. And it was a great place to take crazy risks. And you, we would do one hour a year. I think I remember going on strike when John Burt asked us to do two hours a year, because yeah. that was outrageous. 
I, I'm pretty sure I went on strike as well when they told me to go on to digital, yeah. like because I could only work on film. Look at me now. Um, but, but that being said, you know, we were in Bolivia, we were in the US, I made a documentary on, on Woody Guthrie, we were in the Soviet Union long before anybody else got there, made a piece on Oblomov there and on the Kalashnikov, and it was a tremendous training ground for, you know, people out of college to really spread their wings, to take risks, it was on BBC Two. And it was funny, I was reminded of it in the Golden Globes um, in, in February of this year, or January, I think it's the end of January. And I was sitting in the room and there were four or five of us who were in music and arts, who were the producer directors, and we were always competing and we loved and hated each other. And I looked around the room and I'm like, all four are sitting in this room. Two of them had features that went on to um, James Marsh and Paul Pawlikowski, both mm. had features, they, they'd stayed directors. Charlie Patterson had moved across to producing. And we were like in the bar, you know, going, I was going, you look a bit older, but I really look young. And then we're going, you look older, but I look really young. But the, but the wonderful thing was that it had been a starting ground for a group of people um, who had gone on to very diverse careers. And I, I think that's one of the things I owe the BBC. Yeah. And then, then you, of course, you came to the US originally to run BBC America yeah. at its starting point, really. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was the, 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 the founder of it with a group of people around me, um, and we felt very strongly. The BBC were doing, and I won't go too deep into this, we were doing a big hundreds of millions of dollars deal with Discovery to provide a lot of our documentaries to Discovery. And I felt very passionately, along with people like Dick Emery, who ran Worldwide, that this was the time for the BBC to launch their brand in America. And the reason we thought that, and it paid off more than we had ever imagined, was that we felt it could be a barker, a showcase for the best of British talent. And it turned out because reality and prime time on BBC One and ITV had been dominant for so many years when the US networks were dominated by scripted, we were able to bring out changing rooms that then into turned into you know, trading spaces and that makeover wave that rushed through American television started there and we were able to bring out, I think it was Hotel and the first docu-soaps that again waved and, and, and rushed their way through American television, and then scripted. You know, no British formats had been sold in the US since Steptoe and Son, you know, and All in the Family. And the notion was British formats don't work, British yeah. comedy is different, you know, everyone in British comedies hate each other, we all love each other, why would we want that? They weren't wrong about that, but, and so we sold The Office, um, which was a defining show for BBC America, and we had to change the brand. It wasn't a brand for everybody, we redefined it as HBO with a British accent kind of thing. And the success of The Office on NBC, I think, started a, another wave of, wow, there are extraordinary, not just producers and talent, but there are extraordinary formats that come from the UK. So it was, it was a really fun time, and I spent six or seven years there and, and loved it. There, there, there's actually a question here from, from the audience, which is, uh, the audience are allowed to ask questions? Yeah, yeah they, they, they are. And, uh, <laughs> they've been sending them in, in their thousands. And uh, yeah. it comes to this question, what gives you the idea that the UK is at the forefront of creativity? You've, you've spoken about that before. Now, you would say that because you're very polite and you're generous and you're here, but do you really believe that in yeah. television terms? Yeah, undoubtedly, um, and you, you can only look at the waves of uh, Brits who've gone to Hollywood since the 30s, for God's sakes, and probably earlier, you know, the David Nivens and the Alfred Hitchcocks, we have been, and not the only waves, there have been waves from Brazil and beyond, but England is just a spectacularly creative country. We were, thought to, we were taught to think independently, um, and the television structure here has been, has been in, able to encourage a huge amount of creativity. Um, and we in the US have been beneficiaries for that for many, many years, and you only have to look at ABC. I mean, our on-screen talent, you know, we have Hayley Atwell, and we have Robert Carlyle, and we have many people, Ed Westwick is launching in the fall, directors, four or five I can think of off the top of my head, right, from Charles McDougall to Michael Offer to Mark Mylod, who, 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 who directed Once Upon a Time for us. So here you have, on a Disney-owned network, called the American Broadcasting Company, a Brit who asks a British director, well, it's my team asks him, to create a fairy tale franchise, right, which has now been running for five years, we're immensely proud of it, you know, they turn up in Disneyland and get mobbed and we can sell dolls in all corners. British creativity has always been great and will continue to be. Yeah. 
And what would you, if you were talking to the, the, the audience here, you wanted them to understand if they were developing ideas with one eye on the American market, what's the fundamental difference, you think, between the two, two markets? Look, I think America um, has, we're in a really fascinating time because of the um, choice. People have the gift of total choice. And in a world of total choice, you're only going to pick the stuff that you love. You're not going to go for a least objectionable show that the whole family can watch. You're going to go to the show that you love and you're going to watch in a DVR sense. And that kind of notion really is what drove. I can talk about brand, I can talk about inclusion. But what we actually sat down and said is, we need to create passion shows, shows that audiences are incredibly passionate about. Um, and that's one of the things that's driven such a flight to quality. And when you look at the quality of US television at the moment, here's the thing, it's platform agnostic, right? Digital has, you know, House of Cards, and, and, and Pay has Game of Thrones, and Basic Cable, you know, has, has Mad Men, and, you know, and Broadcast has Modern Family, and Fresh Off the Boat, and Scandal, and I'm only mentioning my own shows because <laughs> I've been in America too long. And I, yeah. <laughs> um, but but so, so what I would say in a, in, in a convoluted answer to that question is, bring incredibly specific, powerful voices. Bring us great television. I mean, a broadcast network, um, and that's us, made American Crime this year, which you probably, probably haven't seen a lot of here. It's an extraordinary piece of television. And it's the kind of risk taking that we used to take on BBC Two when I was there in the 80s. Um, we were lucky enough to be nominated for a lot of uh, Emmys for it. And, and I think watch that and ask yourself, can we, can we match the glorious quality of that? And so it's really fun to be an executive at a time when you can take risks like that. However fluid the market is, it is driving our audience towards great shows. How great is that? Mm. And by the way, it's driving a lot of feature talent, many of them from our company and beyond, to come into television. So we have Joan Allen coming up, Viola Davis is there, feature directors are all coming into television, which makes it a really exciting time. I mean, five years ago, you would have looked at the American landscape and you would have seen, you'd seen suddenly cable taking off with wall-to-wall -wall reality shows about porn shops, et cetera, et cetera. And it looked on the outside, certainly, that broadcast networks were almost in terminal decline. But actually, suddenly, in the last six months, certainly, it's flipped. Everyone now thinks Viacom's channels are in, sort of in, in, in utter turmoil. You guys have really kind of turned it around quite a bit, I think. Well, there are structural reasons for that, and, and, and then, there, there, then there are show reasons for that. And, and by the way, it's always about show. As John Laster says, um, quality is the best business plan. Mm. And what a brilliant quote. Um, but there are structural reasons for that. The broadcast networks are fully distributed, and we have moved from a single revenue source, which is ad sales, which drives you to ratings for the second, to a multiple revenue source where, where we now have what's called retrans, which is basically a subscription, which drives you towards strong brands. It's one of the reasons we've built ABC into a big brand now, just to, not just to watch minute by minute. And then because we have network and studio together, we're able to own a lot of our shows and get a tremendous amount of value beyond the broadcast showing uh, on syndication and cable, on, on digital and, and globally. So those are reasons structurally. But, but the real reasons behind that are really about the shows. And let me sort of put that into, in, in, a, in a few, I hope, short sentences. Five years ago when I came in, it was like written in stone the rules of broadcast television, right? And I'm an assimilating foreigner. I have to take these seriously. I have to you know, turn up three minutes late for every meeting. All the cultural of the country I have to follow <laughs> because I live in Brazil, I live in America, I have to follow that. And the rules are you know, all leads have to be likable and square-jawed, and probably white, Starsky and Hutch are white, His, their boss can be black, you can't have Starsky black, yeah. right? And procedurals are stronger than, than serialized, you can't really have fairy tales, you can't really have period shows. Five years later, all that's changed, right? The moral clarity of Leeds. And now you have Viola Davis standing there, and Kerry Washington, Kerry's throwing elections yeah. and sleeping with a married guy, everybody loves her, you know, Viola is literally getting away with murder. And, you know, uh, the moral complexity of our leads, which you would have associated with pay cable five years ago, is absolutely flowed into what we've done. And we're not the only people. We're proud to be at the forefront of that. Um, as I say, Empire is another great example of that. But it does open broadcast up 
to fabulous storytelling. And the fact that we can get huge audiences for these shows means, I hope, that we're a, we're, we're a place that great British talent want to be. Talking about moral complexity, I'd like to show a clip from something you've got up and coming this season, which I think yeah, where, you agree. Where is this going now? <laughs> I, think, I think we can agree that this is morally complex characters. Can we, can we show our, our clip, please? So why go back to the Muppets? They are hilarious. This is such a great show. Because um, what Bill Prady, who makes it, and he, he comes from Big Bang Theory, he's a fantastic uh, creator. Um, he came into us and, you know, if you're going to bring a franchise, you've got to have a fresh way of looking at a franchise that's mm -hmm. been there before. One of the glories of working for ABC is that we're part of the Walt Disney Company, which has the best brands in the world, right? We li I live in a company that as Marvel and Lucas and, and, uh, and Pixar and Muppets and many others that are there. And we have fairy tales on the network, we have S.H.I.E.L.D. on the network. But they don't ask us to do it. And in this, this particular case, Bill came in and he said, look, the Muppets, when we were all kids, was actually taking the piss out of variety shows. Like they weren't, That's what was dominant yeah. and they made fun of them. And why don't we go out there and make fun of Modern Family and The Office and kind of all the shows you've been associated with kind of thing. And it released this fantastic creativity. I mean, there's Kermit sitting on the 405 getting really irritated with traffic. And there's Miss Piggy, who's actually, you realize, down the pretty threatened. I mean, she gets in up in the morning and she cakes on the makeup because he's dating a younger pig. It's because it's, it's, <laughs> he likes pigs. Um, and it's, it's just really, every time we look at it, we can't help smiling. Uh, it's a great show. Um, you've talked a lot about scripted, but you haven't talked anything, I think, about reality on yeah. ABC. And it, and it looks increasingly difficult to launch a successful reality on, on, and your two biggest show are Dancing with Stars and The Bachelor, both of whom are now over 10 years old. Um, yeah. it, it sort of is questionable, I suppose, how you launch a new reality show, isn't it? So two things to that. First of all, we, we had a huge launch. It's an established brand. But we had the, the biggest launch of the summer with Celebrity Family Feud with Steve Harvey, which did a huge number. And sort of shows that if you bring the right party with the right host, um, you really can break through. And, it, and it, was, it, was the, it was the top show of the summer. That being said, I will give huge amount of credit to Dancing and to Bachelor. We have on Monday nights, um, I don't think this has happened since like the 70s, 52 weeks of original programming because we rock and roll between those two assets. And, um, you know, dancing is just, they're two, I think the two most social shows on television, Scandal is incredibly social too. Um, and, you know, unlike some of the other brands that are out there, the showrunners there have really reinvigorated them every time. And, you know, Bachelor is just as relevant to millennial women today probably more so than it was 10 years ago, and I don't think anybody would have predicted that. That being said, you know, there's a, there's a subtext to your question, which is it's hard to launch reality. And, and the reality is, we, we were talking about BBC America, there was a time when any reality that you put on was incredibly fresh, from Millionaire to Survivor to Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And it is absolutely true that the shock of the new isn't there anymore because many of those new genres have been done and done extremely well. It just puts more pressure on our reality producers to make sure that they can come up with great shows as we did with Celebrity Family Feud. But people always talk about genres going up and down. They're talking about comedy being down and then look, we've got a night of fabulous comedy. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it's perfectly possible to do great reality. It's increasingly, I think, a problem in the UK as well. You, you see new reality shows being launched that just somehow aren't getting the traction in the way that a new drama would actually. And it's interesting, ITV have had some sex, a bit like you with Family Feud, going back to old titles, which the audience knows and understands. I suppose it's easy to market in some, some way. But you're still open to new reality formats. No, absolutely. We have a fabulous head of reality called Rob Mills. We love yeah. new ideas. We have specific places we can launch them and, and, and enjoy them. And these things are cyclical. Yeah. They'll come back. I was quite taken with John Langrass' co comment, I don't, I don't know if you saw it, when he said that there's, there's almost too much great, great content out there at the moment. There's, there's almost too much great scripted content. Do you ever, do you ever feel that? As an well, th th there's never too much incredibly high quality content. Um, and there is more of a fight than there has ever been for the great showrunners. It's not like there are more show great showrunners in the US than there were 10 years ago, and there are many, many more people buying scripted content. 
Um, he's talking from an FX perspective, where you know cable networks are looking to define themselves. Um, but no, we don't feel that at all. In fact, quite the opposite. We've been able to launch a number of successful franchises over the last few years, you know, which which and, and we have the ability to continue to do so. Uh, broadcast is still the biggest platform in the world. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in China there's a bigger platform. But broadcast is still the biggest platform in the US for us to be able to launch new and great scripts. And it really depends on the great quality. And you've got to have a great showrunner. You've got to have a great showrunner. And, and in the US, I think this is self-evident. Most people in the room knows, know this. But you know, when I was at the BBC, you know, the directors were the kings. And we, you know, we claimed ourselves as producer directors. And, but the showrunners, because we do 24 episodes and we do five or six seasons, in television, not movies in the US, they are the voices and they're the ones that drive it. And I, you know, when I first got to America, I'm like, I'm a director, and I'm like, really? <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's about finding great showrunners. And we're very lucky because we have such a powerful studio now. And we're making, I think, 32 series to have so many strong showrunners on overall deals at the studio, which is, of course, how it works in the US. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to open it up to, to questions. So if we could have the house lights up and hopefully there are some people who'd like, who'd like to ask Paul something. Uh, I've got someone down there. I can't quite see you. Can we get the microphone? Can you just say who you are and... Uh, he's number four. He's number four. Hi, I'm Connor and I'm uh, with the BBC. Um, I just want to ask Paul, um, by the way, I think you've had a great career so far. The way you've described it, it sounds really, really fascinating. So, but I want to ask in particular about um, UK and US television, and in particular the market, and how different it is. Um, firstly, can I ask if there's anything from the UK industry that you would like the American industry to take away, what would it be, and vice versa for the US, the UK to take from the US TV market? I think I'd be hard pressed, and I don't want to opine too much about the UK because I've been out so long. I'm super impressed how many um, independent producers there are in the UK. Some of them on overall deals from big companies, but you know the, the diversity of ideas is always incredibly invigorating every time I, I come back. But I, I would put it slightly differently. I think there's been a symbiotic relationship between US and British television. I think there have been on-screen, off-screen, and even executive talent who have moved back and forward. And I believe that's enriched both countries. I know ABC has been enriched by a tremendous amount of influx of British talent. But I hope that you know there are many times when British comedy, British comedy is stronger. I mean, when I was at BBC America, we made a huge push forward. There was The Fast Show. Um, there was obviously The Office. Um, and it was at a time when American comedy was trying to copy Friends. And so what's so great about that symbiotic relationship is that as the cycles go through and they're on different structures, you can re-fertilize each country by bringing in good ideas as we did with The Office. And there are plenty of times that I remember being at ABC, at, B at BBC, when everybody was like, we need to create a writing room. How do we create shows like Friends, you yeah. know, where we can do 22 episodes and you know the shows that came out of that. So I would argue that symbiotic relationship is incredibly valuable and has always been. Uh, one at the back there, Kenta. And then over there. Hi, Paul. It's Kenton Allen from Big Talk. I just wonder whether you could talk a bit more about the economic relevance of diverse audiences to the network and your advertising colleagues. Because I, I don't know if it's true, but I suspect that for commercial broadcasts in the UK, the spending power of the, of the diverse, ethnically diverse audience is not yet significant enough for advertisers to want to get those audiences. And how, what does that look like for ABC and, and your advertising colleagues? and reaching those other, the Latino audience and the, and the African-American audience? Uh, here's my answer. I think you lead with great shows. And I know I've said that before, but let me sort of dig a little bit deeper into that, which is that, first of all, our, we get huge African-American ratings for, for Scandal into How to Get Away with Murder, but we get huge ratings across the board for all ethnicities, including whites, Latinos, and others. And our, our, our advertisers are desperate to get into those shows. So what you do is you create shows that resonate, and hopefully resonate not for specific audience, but for across the board. That's really why I said we've been so encouraged to see incredibly specific shows. Blackish is a great example of it. Blackish has the lead out from Modern Family and really retains almost the same audience. In other words, a big American audience is going in. They're loving that show. It's very specific. 
Kenya and Jonathan Groff have, have an incredibly clear attack. And in, in a way, like fresh off the boat, it leans into race, but it does so in a way that the whole country is loving. If you can get a show that the whole country is loving, your advertisers are gonna rush after you and they're not gonna ask that question. That's my take on it. Uh, I've got one over there and then we'll come to number two, so. Peter White, Broadcast Magazine. Hey, um, interested that you said that you're super impressed with the number of, of independent producers in, in the UK. Um, a number of your studio rivals, one of which uh, is, is interviewing you and, and the likes of Warner Brothers um, have production assets in the UK. Now that you run the studio as well as the, as the network, is that something that you thought about increasing ABC's international production reach? Well, we certainly, I mean, we reach out all the time to find talent, and we've, we've, we've talked about Kelly, we've, we've talked about Sami, who runs my comedy in the US. We are, we are out here all the time looking for formats, looking for writers, looking for talent. We did a, a pilot with Jack Whitehall, we did a pilot with Sharon Horgan. We are always looking, and by the way, so I was at BBC. We had scouts in England saying, you know, Ricky Gervais's three minute, you know, um, inappropriate boss tape is frigging brilliant, pile on it. So we are extremely aggressive to do that. Whether, I think is the underlying uh, part of the question, whether we're looking to expand the investment, that, that, that's, that's not how we're playing it. We're looking to expand our relationships with great talent. Yep. Uh, James Blake from Edinburgh Napier University. Grey's Anatomy used to have an interaction. Oh, there you go, sorry. Grey's Anatomy used to have an interactive app what happened to it, and do you think there's a future for these second screen experiences? Well, in, in some ways, second, third, fourth, and fifth screens are now part of the way everybody watches. And if you watch TGIT as it plays through on Sunday night, and on Thursday night, and that's where we do Grey's and Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder, um, you can see Facebook light up, Twitter light up as we go through each twist and turn of each of those three shows. Um, and of course, you know, you have increased DVR viewership on every single platform beyond that, be it Scandal, which we sold to digital, and it became a hit because people binged watched it over the summer and came back. And our ability on our own app to create um, other digital extensions and brands and other ideas that go from that. So it's amazing how shows live 24 seven all the way through. We still though drive to the amazing experience of leaning back and watching a show. Because if you're not loving a show, if you're not transported by that show, if you're not suspending your life and your, your disbelief, um, then you're not transported and that's what drives so much of the conversation. So I think it's a more complex world now and we have partly driven by our magnificent marketing team and partly driven by people like Kerry in Washington, an who is incredibly sophisticated, and I thought taught a lot of the US market how to socially extend her conversation. Um, we put a lot of effort into that at that, but we, we, we don't try to limit it. It's how our brands live right the way across the, the US landscape. Because you did that interesting thing with Kerry, where it was can't cope without Pope when Scandal wasn't on air, to keep the still giving the audience yeah, we, we, we create sub-brands going into the shows. We, but also, you know, it's such a meta world where people understand what she's passionate about, what clothes she loves, what, you know, she's a, she's a fashion icon as well as the lead of the show. And there were times early on, five years ago, where people didn't want to reveal what happened behind the curtain. Now it's a part of it. It's the fun of it. Everybody knows it. It's what drives Bachelor. It's what drives Scandal. And... You know, I would say arguably, because we have the most social conversation out of ABC than all the networks, I would argue social networks have allowed us to be more social. Because you talk about, well, what's happening with broadcast or with cable, you know, over time, we actually reach more conversation today than we did before all these platforms existed. And that bizarrely gives us a lot of cultural re relevance, but only if we do good shows. If I do a bad show that doesn't resonate, that doesn't work. I think we've got time for one more question. And there we go, Adam down there. Hi Paul, uh, hey. Adam John from Sky. Um, you, you spoke about anticipating a move into serial uh, drama and the morally ambiguous feed. I'm just wondering, you know, looking at the pilot season next year, what you've got your eye on, uh, whether there's a, a new trend you're anticipating or excited by it. 
Well, it's, it's look, in, in the end, we continue to deliver to what our brand is, which is, it's a great thing about ABC that if we take risks, uh, they tend to pay off. If I do stuff that's you know, bland and cookie cutter, it tends not to work. That's not true of all brands, but it's true of this one, which makes the job a lot more fun. I'm not gonna pick between my children because they're watching very closely as we go through. <laughs> But suffice to say, we're extremely excited about the shows that we've got coming up this year. You know, Muppets obviously is, is tracking extremely well for us. We have two great shit soaps on Sunday night. We've done Johnson in one of them and Priyanka Chopra in the other one. We have Joan Allen coming up mid-season. We have The Catch with Mireille Enos. That comes out of TGIT. So we, we like to break the rules and we like to push the boundaries as we go through. Um, and it's, it's played to our strengths. CBS, for instance, is driven by, much more by process and procedurals and has been a very successful model for them, not just in the US, but of course internationally. Um, but the ability for people to binge watch our shows, either on our DVR or, or on the, the, the digital platforms that we sell, has allowed us to recruit people into serials in a way that you could never do. You know, the, the shape of A Desperate Housewives was how much can we start with and how long can we hold on to them? Whereas if you look at the, the shape of Scandal, it's partly because Scandal launched with a good first three episodes and then the sixth episode was amazing. And nobody could stop talking about it. They then binge watched over the summer and the second season grew and the third season grew. And that's played to our strengths because we tell emotional, serialized, character-driven stories and we do this season two. Do you think you could ever work in Britain again in the TV industry? Do you think I'll ever work in, you, yeah, in you, you need to ask my wife that. She's hoping every day. Really? So, <laughs> but you don't, you don't fancy coming back, coming back and joining us? Well, I have a, I have a, we have a very happy, the problem is my kids are total Americans. Yeah. I took them out there when they were five and six. And they're like, you're ruining my life, you're making, taking me to California. I'm like, what's not to love? You know, you're, you're California. And now they're total Americans with American accents. And well, I did hear one of them once reading Harry Potter with all the accents. So somewhere deep down they can do Still. a Yorkshire <laughs> accent, a British accent, an East End accent, they can do Hagrid. But, they're Americans, that's hard. Paul, thank you for, for thank you showing so us your shows. Thank you for the conversation. I've got to thank our sponsors, Creative Scotland and the British Film Commission. But more importantly, please show your appreciation for Paul Lee. Thank you.